Amen. You know, um, I was just thinking while Dwayne was praying, you know, I was with the Lord at that moment, yes. But you know how your mind goes. And what I'm about to say in 45 minutes, he just said in 30 seconds in a prayer. So you guys can go home now if you would like. Because really, that's what he was praying, really. Uh, and that was true. Uh, everything that he said, there is nothing better than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we should not settle for anything less. And I remember right where I was at, I was sitting right there about where you are, Nick. Right about there is when the Lord got a hold of my heart. And I'll never forget when the preacher was preaching. He said, do you want God's best in your life? And I was like, yeah. He's like, well, then why are you even here? I, now, I didn't say yes to him. I just remember saying, yes, I want God's best in my life. And he goes, like, why are you even here? And it was at that moment when God really showed me in my heart there was nothing more than to serve my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God wants you to give you his best. You should want his best. Amen. So, you know, this next uh, four weeks, uh, you have right here in front of you this book. We'll talk about it here in a second. Obviously, um, I am not browning. Um, I do not have that height. Maybe a little bit better looking, maybe a little. Just See, I can say that now because we're not being recorded. He's not going to see this, right? But, uh, but, um, but he's on vacation. I think all of you know that he's taken a couple weeks off, and it's well-deserved. Um, he is a true shepherd. If I'm going to put any title on that man, he's a true shepherd. And when you shepherd a flock, it takes, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time. It does take a lot out of you. And I think all of you could really look at Brownie and his heart and his mind for you guys, and he loves you. And, uh, um, and now it's time. He's taking some time aside. He's spending time with family, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, but also, I know my pastor. He's not just spending time with his physical family, but he's spending time with the Lord. Um, and that's what he does when he gets away. He really is always seeking God's face to really find direction and vision and where God has us. And God has used our pastor to place us in a wonderful place, in a, a position of vision and mission. And uh, so please continue to pray for him as uh, he's in the Northeast with family. He'll be back in a few weeks. And uh, we, knew, we do not know neither the day nor the hour, but he's coming, right? And uh, he will be back. And so praise the Lord. And, <laughs> and so um, where God had led us is um, we have a ministry that's kind of on the heels of taking it to the streets that our church was about a few years ago before COVID hit. And so this ministry is called Salt and Light, which is really, you know, tags to that same ministry of taking it to the streets. Um, and it's come about in a way where biblically we as a church are called Salt and Light. You know, and, you know, you could go in and define all of that, but I like the simple definition of that salt makes people thirsty. You know, and if we, the church, are the salt, guess what? We're supposed to make other people thirsty for Jesus Christ, right? But then we're also the light, and the light gives direction and guidance. And, you know, as we are to point people to Christ in this darkened world, we're not just to point, but we're to lead. And that's what a flashlight does. It helps lead you and guide you through darkness. And so that's where the ministry has come about, that we as a church are salt and light. And so where God led Brownie and I is just to take, take the church for the next four weeks to this simple study called Take It Personally. I think it was about four or five years ago that Randy Adams taught this over in the fellowship hall to a group. Um, I don't believe I was here. If I was, um, I don't remember. I'm just kidding. No, if I, I believe I was in Zambia or we were on our way that time. I'm just kidding, Randy. But, uh, but so with this, you have a book in front of you. Um, you can take it if you want. You can use it. It's a simple outline. There's, it's, it doesn't go in deep here. It just has a few fill-in-the-blanks that we'll be having. I'll have them up on the screen for you. Um, and those fill-in-the-blanks, uh, the main points and sub-points, are all reinforced by Scripture. Now, we're not going to be able to get to all the Scripture, obviously, but all four weeks will be in this book. So please feel free to take it. If you want to leave it, you can leave it. Take your own notes however you decide. But you'll want to bring it back each week because each lesson will be in the book, okay? And so... With that, let's go ahead and pray, and then we're going to go ahead and get started on this lesson. And again, let me just tell you that everything that we're going to be learning, okay, everything that we're going to be talking about, I'm going to set this down here, is messages and, and 
that we as a church have already heard. I mean, they are. There's nothing probably going to be new to a lot of you. For some, there could be. But it's just the simple message of our responsibility to fulfill the Great Commission. So we've already heard them, but I'm just telling you, we need to hear them again. And we need to hear them again. And we need to hear them again. You know, I, I, I remember going through some notes, and, and I remember hearing that, uh, or reading about, in the new, when the church was birthed, they didn't have to have evangelistic classes on how to evangelize. They just did it. They just went, you see. And in time, as we'll talk about this in a little bit, we fall off a little bit at times. We need to be reminded. We need to be refreshed. We need to be refined on the importance of getting out and fulfilling this great commission. And so let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer, and, uh, and we'll go from there. Father God, we thank you and praise you. What a wonderful time you've allowed the church to come together and to worship you on this first day of the week. That's why we're here, God. We're here to worship you, to glorify you with truth, with our words, with our actions, with our mind and our heart, with the pr preparing our hearts through song. And that was all for you. And we thank you that you've allowed that to affect us, to be able to worship you. You are a holy God, and that's your desire for us. So I ask and pray, Lord, that everybody in here today's heart would be ready and prepared to bring and take in the word and then be challenged to go out into the world and be your hands and feet. We love you and praise you, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's see here. Is this on? It's on. It's supposed to be working. It's not working. I have it on, I promise you. We put a new battery in it. All right, so go ahead and go to the next one. You got it? All right. I'm going to have to let you know when to move forward. And so this, this title of this week's lesson is called Making a Difference. Okay? And, and if you read the book, the book starts out with an illustration. And in this illustration, there's, a, there's this beach. And there's, if you look down the beach, there's all these, these uh, uh, stars, you know, the, what do you call them? Starfish. And there are just thousands of them covered on the beach that have been washed up on the shore. And this man walks up and he sees a little boy picking up one starfish and he's throwing it back in. And he picks up another and he throws it into the ocean. And the man's like, what are you doing? Why, why are you doing this? He said, there's too many. There's too many. I mean, it would take months, if not de days, months and years to be able to get them all back in. You're not going to make an impact. You're not going to make a difference. And then the little boy, he leans over and he picks up the one star and he throws it back and he says, made a difference for that one. And he picked up another one and he says, made a difference for that one. You see, the illustration in there is that every starfish was valuable. Every starfish was important. And so when we take that and translate that to a spiritual thought process, it all comes down to how we see people. And I preached a while back on the value of a person, and it's funny that it comes back up because I didn't plan this, but I'm asking the same question. How much value do you see in people? Are people worth saving? See, Jesus thought so, and if we are the church, we're the salt and light, we ought to think the same way, right? How much value do we put on someone? Let's see, oh yeah, huh? there you go. So if you look up here, this is a breakdown of the religions of the world. And I can't see it that well, so I'm going to turn around real quick. So approximately 8 billion people on this earth. And I think if you look it up, it's 7.8 billion. I rounded it up. And so when you break down religions, you're going to find different breakdowns. This is the one I found. This is the one I used. So approximately 2.5 billion that claim Christ. 2 billion that are Muslims. 1.2 billion Hindu 1.2 affiliated to nothing, I guess. Buddhist, 500 million. Folk religion, 500 million. And other, 60. And I, I don't know what the other is. I, you could probably pour that into something else, right? So the folk religion, just to give you a, a definition of that, beliefs or practices, rituals, and symbols that originate from other sources other than religious leaders. So it, it could be superstitions. It could be just a... Uh, uh, tribes, whatever it might be, but it did not originate from a specific person, okay? So when you look at this, this is how we break down religion. Eight billion people, and you see it there. Go ahead and go to the next slide. 
But if right now, if, I want you to think about this. If everyone just took their last breath at the same time, there would be approximately at least 5.46 billion people that would go straight to hell, that would go to a Christless eternity. Now that should make our hearts leap a little bit. And that's not even counting the 2.5 billion that claim Christianity. We know that that 2.5 billion that claim Christianity... Not all of them are bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. There are a lot of religions out there that use the names, the same terms that we use, but they define them differently. And they're not bought and paid for. So we don't have time to break that down, but that's just a rough estimate. And so that should move our hearts. So when you look at that amount of people that would end up in a Christless eternity, my question is this. Does it, how do you value all those people that are around you and throughout this world? See, it can be overwhelming. It can be overwhelming when you look at that vast number. So how do we re um, reach such a vast number? One person at a time. One person at a time is what you do. Galatians 6.10, our pastor's been preaching. He just finished up a series on the book of Galatians. And this verse really stands out. It says, as you therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who's, um, who are the household of faith. So when it comes to priority, we're to take care of the body of Christ first, but we're to do good unto all men as we have opportunity. You know, our opportunity is much more than it was 10, 20 years ago, because opportunity now can be through a Zoom, you know, online or, or through WhatsApp or whatever. The world is this small. The opportunities are vast, so we have no excuses. But some of our opportunity might just be across the street. It might be in our neighborhoods, whatever it might be. And so as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men. And the only good thing I can think of is give them that, that message that is an eternal message on the life and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the good news that we're supposed to do good unto all men. So the only way is that we must understand the value of one. See, now this is in your books. You can write down if you like. The value of one. What is the value of one? In, this, in the book itself, um, there's uh, Rudolf Giuliani um, is quoted. I think everybody here, most people know Rudolf Giuliani. He was uh, the mayor of New York at the um, World Trade Centers when they were attacked. And this is a quote from him. It's not exact, but it's pretty close to it. It says, the World Trade Center first responders went in the Twin Towers. When they did, they did not worry about if the people were black or white. They did not worry if they made 400000 a year or 24000 a year. When you're saving lives, they are all precious. You see, the firefighters didn't worry about who was in there. They just knew that people were there, and they wanted to go in and rescue them at the cost of their own life, right? Now, you put that in a spiritual sense. It's the same for us. We can't look at the color of the skin. Believe it or not, we can't look at politics, okay? I know there's a lot happening in the world right now that puts anger in you. But you know what I learned? That situation, if you pray for those people, it's kind of hard to be angry at people when you're praying for them. When you're seeing them through the eyes of God, just start praying for them, whoever they might be. Whether you agree with them or don't, pray for them because they are precious to God. When we look at here, Spurgeon, he said something like this. I, it, it, he said, the soul of a person is so valuable that God and Satan are continually fighting over them. There's a battle. God wants to spend eternity with you, but so does our adversary. He wants to spend eternity with you too. Those are the only two options that we have, church. The only two options. And we have to finally, if we have not already started, Start seeing people through the eyes of God. So why is one soul valuable? Why? Well, it's because it's eternal. You see it up there. It's eternal. The reality, there's a reality of eternal life. We're all going to spend eternity one place or another. No matter what, we, what beliefs we fall into, truth is truth. We're going to spend eternity one place or the other. So, and... The word death, when we die, I believe most of us understand that death me does not mean the absence of existence, okay? Death just means separation. 
The moment you take your last breath, your soul is now separated from this shell of the body, this tabernacle. And it goes on to last for all of, all of eternity somewhere else. So all souls will last with eternity. Some will be with Jesus. But unfortunately, like we saw in those numbers, more will be without him. But we're supposed to narrow that number down. That's our responsibility to narrow the number, to see people the way that God sees them. In Mark uh, 8.36, it says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and to lose his own soul? What's the profit? What profit it if you're going to go after this world? Because I know in this church on Sunday mornings, majority of the people that come are those who have professed Jesus Christ. But I also know even within this group, probably not all of you are saved. And there's something out there that's keeping you from trusting in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. There's something that kept you from doing that up until the point that those of you are saved when you got saved. I know what it was with me that was keeping me. It was my party lifestyle. It was my, my riotous living. That's what I enjoyed. I enjoyed my sin. Until finally, God got a hold of my heart and I said, yes. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. These are all the things that are, are fighting for a rivalry in your life and in your heart to keep you from coming to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And it's those same things, church, it's keeping you from growing in Christ. You see, what is it? What is worth your soul? And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, I hope you're asking yourself that question. So what is this value of one? What does this tell us? It tells us this, that heaven and hell are real. Heaven and hell are real. See, we come from the assumption that where our beginning point is from Scripture. I believe Scripture is 100% truth. It's truth. Now, you, you don't have to believe it, but it doesn't make it any less truth. Truth is truth. It's like, I don't believe in gravity. Okay, well, get on a building and jump off and tell me you don't believe in gravity, right? We know what's going to happen. You cannot deny truth. It's the same way. So what does Scripture say about this? In Luke chapter 16, verse 22 through 24, it says this, And it came to pass that the beggar died, and he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Think about that, being in torments. And seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Sure, yeah, 24. And he cried and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. You know, in this book, uh, uh, the pastor, and I didn't identify him, his name's Paul Chapel. He's pastor of Lancaster Baptist Church in Lancaster, California. He has an illustration, not an illustration, but an example that he knows a man that reads this passage every day to always remind him that there are people in torment separated from God. That's probably not a bad idea. But here we have an example. Now, this is not a parable. Jesus had parables that he would tell stories, right, that might bring about truths that we could apply to our life. And those parables were for his disciples to learn and to grow and to understand that they might know more about his work and his ministry, okay? Well, in parables, he never used names. Here he does. So I believe biblically truth that he's telling us a true story that happened. There was a rich man. There was another man named Lazarus. One was poor, one was rich. One, the rich man placed his faith and trust in the world and the things and possessions of the world, right? And we talked about that verse what profit, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The rich man understands what that question means right now. But Lazarus, he's in Abraham's bosom, which, which is, is in paradise at that time. And I don't understand it 100%. I can just tell you with scripture. But the Bible says that hell down there in the center of the earth, there's a place called hell. One side is hell, the other side's Abraham's bosom, and there's a, a great gulf in between. And there's obviously communication in between, and I don't know what that looks like. I, I, I can't even wrap my mind around that. But you have one guy who's in torment and another guy who's not, and he's crying over, I just want a little bit of water. I just want a little water. Can you please help me? See, hell is a real place. Hell is, but this is the interesting thing about hell. 
Hell is a place to be feared, but it's not the ultimate fear that a person should have. There is a place that is actually much worse. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and, and turn to, uh, let me get to the right page here. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to um, Revelation chapter 20. And I'm going to read down here through some verses in verses 11 all the way through 15. Because there's another place that is actually to be feared more than hell itself. And he says here in verse 10, or in verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and in him that sat on it, from whose face the earth um, and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things, which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their own works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. See, I hope you see that. We always talk about, which is true, that hell is a place we should fear, but there's something that's worse because the Bible says here that those who die now will go to hell. That's what the Bible says. I'm sorry to tell you that. And I know these are strong words. You don't hear very many messages these days on hell, but it's a reality that we all must talk about and must discuss. But one of these days, God's gonna take that and he's gonna pick it up and he's gonna cast it into a much worse place called the lake of fire. See, all souls are eternal. All souls are precious. All souls are worth fighting for, even, even our greatest memory, our enemies. There's a quote by A.W. Tozer. He says this, No man is better for knowing that God so loved the world, uh, the, the world of men that he gave his only begotten son to die for their redemption. In hell, there are millions who know that. Theological truth is useless until it's obeyed. These are the men he's talking about in this quote. There are millions of people right now that are separated from Jesus Christ that would love to hear this message just one more time, but they're never going to hear it again. There's nothing that we can do for them. We can't pray them out of any. Unfortunately, their life is sealed, but I guarantee you they would come out and say, accept Jesus as your Savior. You see, here's the thing. We have 5.46 billion plus plus that are still alive. We have the opportunity to reach some of them. There's a lot of starfish that need thrown back into the ocean. But are we going to take the time to do so? So what is this theological truth? We understand Jesus is the only way of salvation. We sang about it this morning. See, church, we, this, we have to once again wrap our minds around this, that Jesus is the only way of salvation. This is a theological truth. So what does the Bible say on how a person to get saved? John 14, 6 says this, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Either Jesus is speaking truth or he's a liar. One of the two. I believe he's speaking truth. Acts 4, 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. No other name under heaven whereby a person must be saved. Do we believe that? Do we believe that that is truth? See, the religion's way of salvation, we just talked about the Muslim, the Hindu, the Buddhist, the folk religion, all those others, and even atheists fall into this. It's all built on a merit system. What can I do good to please my God, and that will get me in? And I know this is cliche, but I'm going to say it anyway. Religion is man working his way to God, where Christianity is God working his way to man. You see? That's what religion is. Even atheists, even they do, those who don't claim it, we know they have the ability because the Bible says that God lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Every man has enough of God in him through his creation and conscience to, to woo him, to draw him to him. You know, my son Titus and I were talking about this. Not every time, but if you go out and watch a video of something tragic that happens in the moment, Sometimes they're choice words, words we can't share here, right? But other times, what's the first thing? Oh, God! Why is it that the, a lot of the times the first response to something tragic is, oh, God, they cry out to God. See, that's the way we were built by our God. 
We were built that way that when something bad happens, we cry out to the creator. See, that's a natural thing. And what an atheist is doing is building themselves to be their own God and creating their own truth. But yet when it comes down to it, they're crying out to God for help. Many do, you see. So religion is just that. It's a merit system. Even an atheist is a merit system. And they're doing it on their own standards. But for Christianity, biblical Christianity, the work was done for you and I on the cross by God himself, Jesus Christ. And I love this verse. I love this verse, Acts 20, 28. This is where uh, Paul is talking to the leaders of the church of Ephesus, and he's encouraging them. And look what he says here. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, wait a second. This here says that God purchased the church with his blood, but it was Jesus Christ who was up on the cross who shed his blood, right? So which is it? You see, you have to marry the two together. These verses right here, when you compare Scripture with Scripture, show us that Jesus Christ is God, and God shed his blood on the cross at Calvary for the church, for the church, not one individual, for the church. So here's how that works. If you don't know Christ, choose God. If you choose God, he chooses you, and you become part of the church, you see? He died for the church, and it's simple for you to do that, to get involved, to be a part of his body. So what are we to do? Well, Jesus himself came to seek and to save. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. We as men were lost, and, and as women, we were lost. But you know what else was lost? His image. His image was lost in lost man. And he came to get his image and to be that lost image that was out of man and through the blood of Jesus Christ to take that image for those who trust him and to place it back inside of a person to make them whole again spiritually. See, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Mark 10, 45 says this, for even the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And that word ransom, ransom, it's a redemptive price. It was a redemptive price. What is that redemptive price? It was his blood that he shed on Calvary. That's what it cost our Savior. You see, he left. Jesus dwelled in a place of comfort. He dwelled in a place of glory. He gave up comfort for the souls of the lost, okay? He gave up comfort for the souls of the lost. So what are you willing to give up? And I want you to look at this video real quick. Jesus, I am so excited today. It's like I woke up and thought, today is the day to get working for Jesus. Kat, I'm so excited to find someone who's ready to take action and get things done. Oh man, I am that girl. Exactly. Yeah. Now, I've got something perfect for you. So let's get started. Okay. What are you doing? Uh, stand up. Remember, we were gonna take action. Yeah, but this is where I always sit. Right, but... I need more than this. Oh, I know what you're getting at. Okay, Jesus, how much do you want? What? $50, is that enough? Oh, uh, that's not what I meant. Oh, uh, all right, well, 100 then, you know. I mean, you drive a hard bargain. <laughs> um, okay, but um, you might not want to cash this till next Friday, you know what I'm saying? Right. There you go. Okay, okay. Kat, really, I, I do think it's great that you want to give, but I want you to mentor a younger woman. Ooh, yeah, right. Well, Jesus, you know, I'm not really into, like, teaching people and stuff. I mean, I'm not, I don't really get into that. Okay. Um, okay, you, you know that woman at the office, Amy? Yeah. I want you to take her out to lunch. Tell her about me. Um, well, Amy is different. I mean, like, really different, you know? I know, but she needs to know about me. Mm, and I can tell the people at the church to call her. I mean, they get paid to do things like that. I want you to do that. Jesus, I just don't feel comfortable doing that. What are you doing? I am waiting for the fighting up panic. No, Kat, the problem is you're too comfortable. Light reading. See calendar choices? Would rather green. All right, so that was kind of a punch in the gut. 
Huh? I mean, it was for me, and I've seen that thing many times. But the question, this really goes right along with what we're talking about because we have grown too comfortable. We've gotten comfortable in our lives. Praise the Lord for the United States and all the blessings that it shed. But at the same time, there's some negative to it. We've gotten pretty comfortable where they're at. What are we willing to give up? Okay. We must get up and get up from our comfort and go. We've got to go. That word go means it's an action word. Okay. The church is the only vehicle that God has chosen to take the message. It's not going to happen through anybody but the church. So we're called to go. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. That word power means authority. It's God who's given us the authority. Jesus Christ has been given authority to give us authority. And you know what this is? That authority is a command. And that command is to go. And that go is an action but we can't do it while we're sitting down. Believe me, God's been, been working in my life too, you know, and lacking the boldness to get out. He just showed me recently, Brian, you can't be bold by sitting behind that desk. You know, I have a lot of stuff I got to do in the office, but I can't get out and be bold to people and learn to be bold if I'm sitting behind a desk. I've got to get up. That power is a sense of authority. This is a command which involves action. But when we finally go, God might bring forth fruit in our life. Or at least we'll be able to, 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 to plant some seeds. But we're to win. We're to win people to Christ. It says, and teach all nations. This teach all nations means to teach people about the gospel. Preach about the gospel. We're to go and preach and teach the gospel. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, that verse says that Jesus Christ is our hope. He is our hope. And I know I've said it many times, but people like to redefine terms. I love to redefine terms. See, that's why you've got to stick to Scripture and, and compare it with itself and define what terms mean. The word hope today means unassurance. Don't know if I'm going to get it. But when you study out the word hope in the Bible, guess what that means? 100% absolute assurance. If Jesus is our hope, he's 100% assurance. That's the promise that's been given to us. We have to go win. We have to go tell people about Jesus. Mark 16, 15 says, And he said unto them, Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. See, we have in our minds that these creature, like something crazy we've seen on TV, right? But that's what we've done. We've perverted and twisted our mind with things like that, right? But when you study out what the Bible says about a creature, we are a creature. People. We're supposed to share with every creature. I don't believe that means I'm supposed to go out and see a grasshopper and share the gospel with a grasshopper, right? That would be silly. But we are to share the gospel with people. But we have another verse over in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new. All things are become new, you see? So hope is what changes a creature into a new creature. Have you been changed? See, the only thing that can do that is the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is in Jesus. But then we see baptized. That's another part. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. I think the majority of us understand what baptism is. We know by the authority of Scripture, baptism has nothing to do with salvation. And if today you have been baptized and uh, you have not gotten saved, the only thing you've gotten is wet. That's it. Right? Because the baptism has nothing to do with salvation. It's always, when you look in Scripture, especially the book of Acts, it always shows it comes after salvation. But that's part of the command. Why? What is this? Well, baptism is a place of commitment. If you are today, are saved, and you have not been baptized, that's your testimony of commitment, that I belong to the true living God. It's the first step of obedience. See, immediately when we lead someone to Christ and they make that profession of faith, we immediately need to be encouraging the, believer, the believers, that new believer, to a place of commitment and get them to a place to where they understand what baptism is. And it's the picture of the death, burial, and resurrection where that old man is dead and you're now a new man, new woman in Christ Jesus. When a person gets saved, they're committing their soul to God. When they get baptized, you're committing your life. So it is a big deal because it's a testimony. And in essence, 
what you're doing is, is think about this. When you're up there getting baptized in front of everyone, it's a testimony and you have witnesses. You're giving every one of those witnesses the freedom to hold you accountable to your walk with Christ. If you start walking away, those witnesses have a right to come to you and say, what happened? I just saw you, you got baptized. Did you not commit your life to the Lord? Why are you not following him now? Now that doesn't happen very often, but in essence, that's what you're doing. You're giving them the freedom to do so. It's complete and total commitment. Baptism is that picture of salvation of what Jesus did for us. And that's why it's so important for us to make that commitment and to take that step. But then it also says here to teach. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. That's the assurance also right there, right? That no matter what you do, no matter where you go, whether you're on this earth or whether you die and take your last breath, you will never be alone. Now, for some of you, that's, that's reassurance, that's rest. For some of you, you're convicted right now because you've been alone and maybe not serving the Lord like you ought to be, you see? And I hope both of those are happening. I hope some of you are rejoicing now, but I hope that there is some conviction because I know I have it. I know I don't redeem the time properly. We just saw the comfort that takes place in our life. You see, we have to make sure that we understand that God is with us, but there has to be a place of growth. There has to be a place of maturity onto a place of holiness. That's what the church is here for. We're here to help you to grow, to get to that place, to where every day you're more and more like Jesus Christ. It's called discipleship. That's our responsibility, and that's what you want. That's what, where your desire ought to be, because it does not take long for someone to stray away, does it, church? Doesn't take long at all. And I mean, I went and I looked at each, uh, a few of these churches and the church of Rome, you know what they, they were just wanting to know the truth. They wanted to know the doctrinal foundation of salvation and of the truth. And Paul was there to give it to them. The church of Corinth became so carnal that they needed to be chastised back to a place of ministry. The church of Galatians, like we just learned about, tried running to the law rather than running to the cross. The church of Ephesus was on a path of leaving their first love, which less than 50 years was accomplished according to the book of Revelation. See, when you leave something, you leave for one to go to something else. We didn't lose our first love. We leave our first love. And that's exactly what happened to the church of Ephesus. They were on a path to leaving their first love, and they ended up accomplishing that task. And the church of Thessalonians, they were a model church. They were a model. They were a church full of faith. But the problem was, was they listened to false prophets and believed that the day of the Lord was already upon them. And the reason I'm sharing this is because it doesn't take long to stray away. It doesn't take long to get off that beaten path. And I have no doubt in our church body, many of us are in one of these areas or could be. I hope you're not, but you could be. Maybe you're here and you're desiring the truth and you want to know the truth of scripture. Praise the Lord, you're at a good church. We can help you with that. Maybe you're a a carnal. Maybe that means fleshful, have fleshful desires, right? And God is now chastising you back to a place of ministry, back to a place in his arms. Running to the cross. I know we all need to run to the cross. We don't run hard enough. Going back to our first love. There are some of you here today that need to leave where you're at and go back to your first love. Remember when you first accepted Christ? How exciting it was. And wow, I just, I remember that moment. I didn't ever feel like I could ever get away from it till I was away from it. And I had to look around, Lord, why did I leave you? And then I come back and then I do it again. And I come back and do it again, right? And then there are some of us here, we need to stop listening to false prophets and start listening to what Scripture says to us. You see, that's the importance of the Great Commission. That's the importance of it right there. Go, win, baptize, and teach. And you are all to be a part of it if you know Christ is your Savior. And it all comes down to this. It comes down to owning the mission. You've got to take ownership of it. You've got to make it real to you and say, this is my responsibility. In this book, there's an illustration here. It says a deacon prayed the same prayer all the time. He said, oh, Lord, 
Touch the unsaved with thy finger. One occasion he stopped and he fell silent. And people asked him if he felt okay. And his reply was this, no, it's just that something seemed to say to me, thou art the finger. You see, it's easy to pray that, Lord, touch the lost, reach the lost, be the hand of God, Lord. But the Lord looks back at us and says, but you are my finger. You are my hand. You are my feet. I think we all know a song out there like that, right? We are the body. Why aren't our hands reaching? Why aren't our feet going? There's truth in that. Hudson Taylor, a missionary to China, said this, the Great Commission isn't an option to be considered. It's a command to be obeyed. The gospel of salvation, the gospel of sanctification, the gospel, the good news. You know what the good news is? Is You can be saved today if you do not know Jesus as your Savior. Amen? That's the good news. But the good news is extended. You can also grow in him and be like your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the good news. That's the Great Commission. So we're to make a commitment. We got to make a commitment. We're too committed to ourselves. We're too committed to our things. We're too committed to this world. When we're just passing through, this is not our life. Our life is with him and we have a responsibility. We got to commit to be that finger. We got to commit to be that hand or those feet. Proverbs 16, three says, commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. You will know where most of our problem is. It's right here. This is where most of our problems are. I remember someone said we got to put down that stinking thinking, you know? I think it was Alan Shelby said that. Stinking thinking. Because our minds control our hearts oftentimes and our actions. And the Bible says, commit thy works unto the Lord, and this, your thoughts are going to be established. But we have to focus on the first part, commit, make a decision, right? And some of us, I know, are afraid to make a decision because the Bible says it's better not to make a vow than to make one and to break it. It's better not to make one at all, right? But we have to also, yes, we have to count the costs. Yes, we have to be real with where we're at and understand, but there has to come a time when we finally step over the line and we start living by faith and not by feeling, believing what the word of God says. Make a commitment to God that, God, I promise I am going to commit my life to you. I'm going to commit telling other people about Jesus Christ because that's what this message comes down to. Are you going to walk away from your comfort and are you going to commit? Comfort or commit? Which one's it going to be? So you got to make a commitment, but then you got to set a plan. You know, evangelism should not be only an event, but it should be an event. You know, and, and again, when I read this, I get so convicted about it. You know, Bobby preached a few weeks ago, and man, it got me going. And it was a message kind of like this one, you know, where it's about evangelism. And it really shook me because I realized that it's easy to sit behind that desk, but it was time for me to get out. So I just started taking some, some New Testaments, and I started putting some tracks in them, you know. And when Tammy and I would go out to eat, when the servant come, I would just give her a Bible and said, hey, this is a gift from us to you. What are they going to do? They're at work. They have to be nice, right? They got to. So, but at the same time, you're giving them the word of God. Actually, we had one woman that uh, I said, um, and I said to her, do you mind if we pray for you? Do you, have any, do you have anything you need to pray? She goes, no, but I'll pray with you. She got on her knees right there in the restaurant and prayed with us. It was amazing. See, that's very easy, but that's what we did. We just decided we're going to start handing those out, you know? And then even then, it's easy to stray away from that. But uh, let me just tell you, at the end of these four weeks, on August 22nd, you're going to have the opportunity to get involved with our salt and light ministry. And guess what? It's not going to be easy. But you know what? Jesus never concealed the cross. He never made it and sugarcoated it. He told his disciples how difficult it was going to be. And then those who were willing to walk the path, those who were willing to fulfill did. The others left. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be difficult. But there's time to make a commitment. This doesn't mean that you should wait till the 22nd. We should always be looking for a moment to share the gospel today. And again, my challenge to you, go out today. There's the King Pantry out there. Just grab one New Testament, one track, put it in there. Most of you are going out to eat today. If you do, go out and just tell somebody that you want to give them a gift. That's simple. I just like to give you a gift. That's all you got to say. And they'll take it. And I don't know what they do with it. 
but you're handing out God's word and the ability and the opportunity for people to come know Christ as their Savior. And then uh, seek God's help. 1 Thessalonians 1.5 says this, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. Remember, assurance, hope, much hope. As you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. You see, when Paul and them came in and approached them, you know what they did? They asked for God's help. They asked for God's help. They came in under the power of the Holy Ghost with the hope of assurance. They looked to God for help. So look, don't do it on your own. You got to ask for help. And as we are getting here to the end, the last one is prepare a message. Prepare a message. You know, right now we have a team in Honduras. And as we speak right now, Randy might be preaching right now as I speak. And they're preparing, I know, to go out to the marketplaces. But they've prepared a message. I know that, that Randy and Sean and Mike have been preparing a message for two months to preach in the marketplaces. And Paloma and Jennifer and, and Catherine, all of them have been preparing to share the gospel with other people. They were prepared. 1 Peter 3, 5, 15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Be ready at all times. And maybe you don't have the steps to lead someone to Christ through Romans Road. We're actually going to talk about that a little bit more next week. Where that's the, the depth we're going to go is really the practical side of things. But one thing you do have is you have a testimony. You have a testimony. You may not be able to articulate exactly everything, but you can at least say, hey, this is where I once was. This is what Christ did for me, and this is where I'm at now. That's how easy it is to give your testimony. Be prepared to give a message just to share with what Jesus Christ did for you. Because in Honduras, they're doing it. Why do we have to go to a different country to do it when we can do it with our own country? This is where we're at, church. This is where we're going for the next few weeks. And I hope and pray that God has really impressed upon your heart either some name, someone, or just more of a boldness and a commitment to get out and to share the gospel with someone. Because in conclusion, this is where we come to. It's time to get out of our place of comfort and do something that challenges us to live by faith. The value of one. What value do you place on one person's soul? How can you go out here and not put that value on when Jesus Christ did and died for it? And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, what value are you placing upon your own soul? To seek and to save, Jesus Christ did that. He came down to seek and to save, and now he's given us a message to go win, baptize, and teach. It's our responsibility. And are we going to own it, embrace it, make it our own? Why? Because it's time that we start taking this personal. It's time we start taking this personal. So here in a second, in closing, you're going to have the opportunity to be able to just spend some time with the Lord. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, today's the day to do it because tomorrow's not guaranteed. The next minute's not guaranteed. You've been clearly seeing the gospel today of Jesus Christ. Today's the day of salvation. But you, church, if you are saved here today, it's time to start owning this. And we're just going to take a few minutes for you to be able to spend time with the Lord. You can come up here and pray and spend some time with him. You can do it in your own seat. But this is your, op um, your opportunity to spend time with the Savior. So whatever need you have, whatever place, this is the time to do it now. Father, Lord, thank you for this time. I ask and pray that.